Do you have a uh, loony or a toonie? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hello, I'm Ray, and welcome to the M2 story. The protagonist of today's story is the $2 coin commonly known as the toonie in Canada. Why is it called that? Well, because one side of the $1 coin is engraved with a bird called the loon, people affectionately call it the loony. But on the $2 coin, there's clearly an image of a polar bear, so why isn't it called the bernie, and instead is called the toonie? The reason is quite simple. Canadians think that if $1 is a loony, then $2, which are two loonies, must be a toonie, right? Furthermore, due to its attractive design, Canada releases commemorative versions with different colors and designs on special occasions, and they can become highly sought after. For instance, the black-edged version commemorating the Queen's funeral was in high demand recently. Even the standard toonie has been turned into various jewelry items like rings and necklaces by fashion enthusiasts in recent years. However, no one could have imagined that this coin, which Canadians take pride in, would one day become a cause for concern. How did that happen? The story began at the end of 2020, when a convenience store owner in Toronto discovered three suspicious $2 coins while counting cash received. Upon confirming with the bank that they were counterfeit, the perplexed store owner reported the matter to the police. The counterfeit coins had significantly different font sizes, shapes, and clarity compared to genuine ones. Moreover, instead of Queen Elizabeth's portrait on the back, there was an image of a shriveled old man. At that time, Queen Elizabeth was in good health and Prince Charles was still the crown prince. The Toronto police initially thought it was a prank by some bored individuals and suggested that the store owner might need glasses. The store owner, having suffered a loss of only $6, decided to let it go. However, what both sides didn't anticipate was that the discovery of these three coins would open the curtain on a 20-year-old case. In the following months, more counterfeit $2 coins were discovered in Toronto. Although they had differences in style from the previous gender-switched queen, they were all clearly fake. The fonts were blurry and skewed, the sizes were inconsistent, and some even had Queen Elizabeth II's name engraved as Elizabeth 1 plus 1, which was both funny and absurd. However, the most commonly discovered counterfeit coins were of a kind known as Big Toe Bear, these coins featured a polar bear on the front with disproportionately large feet and three exaggerated big toes. Compared to the comical old man and witch versions, the big toe bear was relatively discreet. Additionally, coin wear and tear made it challenging to distinguish between real and fake, requiring a magnifying glass for close inspection. This eventually caught the attention of the police. Could these counterfeit coins have been in circulation for a long time? Why did they suddenly become prevalent? It turned out that due to pandemic-related precautions, many stores refused to accept cash, reducing the need for change. As a result, businesses deposited their cash, including a significant number of coins, into banks. During this process, an increasing number of counterfeit coins were discovered. By July 2021, the Toronto Police Service had received over 70 counterfeit $2 coins, and this number continued to rise over time. As a response, the police deployed a significant number of personnel and established a dedicated task force to carefully search for these counterfeit coins throughout the city, with a focus on places where coins are frequently used, such as dollar stores and casinos. As expected, they found thousands of similar counterfeit coins. To their astonishment, when they expanded their investigation, they discovered an even more shocking fact. Banks themselves had a mix of genuine and counterfeit coins. Who would have thought that counterfeit money could be withdrawn from a bank? So, how many fake $2 coins are there in circulation? The conclusion reached by experts from the police, after examining the quantity and wear of counterfeit coins, is that these counterfeit coins may have been in circulation as early as around the year 2000, spanning over two decades. In the greater Toronto area and its surroundings alone, it is estimated that at least 5% or more of the $2 coins are counterfeit. This implies that millions, or even tens of millions, of counterfeit coins are dispersed throughout Canada, and almost everyone has unknowingly received and used them. 
Upon careful consideration, it's not surprising that people became complacent. Rather, they fell into a psychological trap set by criminals. Typically, when you receive a $100 bill, you might take a moment to examine it, feel its texture, and so on. However, what about $2 coins? Most people would simply toss them into their pockets without a second thought, even if a vending machine rejected them. The initial reaction would be to assume a malfunction. The scale of this counterfeiting operation clearly exceeded the realm of pranks. Producing a single coin involves a series of processes such as molding, melting, casting, and polishing. Even small to medium-sized foundries would struggle to achieve this, and the fact that it continued for two decades without detection suggests that these counterfeit coins were likely produced overseas and then circulated in Canada. Canadian law enforcement contacted the FBI in the United States and the Mexican authorities to trace the source of these counterfeit coins, but they received responses indicating that local demand for counterfeit money in their respective countries was already overwhelming, and there was no intention to export counterfeit currency for profit. Another puzzling aspect of these counterfeit coins was that not only did they match the size and weight of genuine coins precisely, but their metal composition was also very similar, indicating a high level of technical sophistication. However, these coins featured laughable errors like Elizabeth 1 plus 1, or the transformation of the queen into an elderly man in the coin's design. Even the big toe bear had visible flaws. Given the significant investment in production, it raised questions as to why better molds weren't used. Canada's National Security Agency also became involved, speculating whether foreign hostile actors were attempting to disrupt their currency. Only large-scale minting facilities at the national level could possess such manufacturing capabilities. The question remained, who was behind this operation? Russians? Chinese? Wealthy Iranians? Or perhaps the rumored Illuminati? A nationwide investigation yielded a mix of good and bad news. The good news was that there didn't seem to be more sophisticated, high-quality counterfeits in circulation. Particularly, since 2012, genuine coins were equipped with anti-counterfeiting technology, featuring finely engraved maple leaves. Therefore, counterfeit coins became extremely rare. However, the bad news was that in older coins, without anti-counterfeiting marks, the counterfeit rate reached as high as 10%. This was especially true for coins minted between 1996 and 2000, where genuine and counterfeit coins were nearly indistinguishable. The worst news was that, apart from the challenge of identifying the source of these counterfeit coins, it was almost impossible to completely recall them from circulation. The ultimate question remained unanswered. If it was an attack on Canada's financial system by hostile foreign nations, why would they produce counterfeit coins instead of targeting the more valuable $100 bills? It wasn't until January 2023 when the Quebec police issued a notice announcing the discovery of a batch of counterfeit $2 coins. This discovery had a unique twist as the province of Quebec unearthed over 10,000 counterfeit coins in one go and the process of discovery was full of drama. The incident took place during the Christmas shopping season in a small town located more than 70 kilometers north of Montreal. The owner of the town's largest hardware store received an order one day from a customer who wanted to buy a snowblower. After testing and negotiating the price for a suitable model, the customer suddenly asked if they could make a cash transaction. Without much thought, the store owner agreed and the customer proceeded to pull out a large bulging backpack from the back of his pickup truck. The backpack was filled with money, making it seem as if a school child had finally broken open a piggy bank they had been saving for a year. Consequently, the store owner had to enlist several employees to put down their other tasks and help count the over a thousand two dollar coins the customer had brought with him. However, the more they counted, the more something seemed off. Why did the polar bears on these coins appear increasingly awkward? Suspicion began to grow and the store owner suggested they visit the local bank together to deposit the coins directly into an account. At the mention of going to the bank, the customer's demeanor immediately became uneasy. After several unsuccessful attempts to persuade the store owner to accept the coins, he decided to pack the coins back into the bag and said, fine, I won't make the purchase then, before swiftly driving away. The store owner picked up one of the coins the customer had dropped, and the next day, 
he went to the bank to have it examined. As expected, the coin turned out to be fake. Since the town had only a few hundred residents at most, the store owner wasted no time in reporting the incident to the police. Subsequently, the police searched the customer's home and found the over a thousand unused counterfeit coins. When asked about the source of these counterfeit coins, the customer's response was quite absurd. I bought them online for one dollar each. Hearing this, the police were left dumbfounded. The customer continued to explain, I didn't think too much about it. When I saw the cheap price online, I thought it was a good deal. I heard that during the Christmas shopping season, even gift cards from stores can be discounted, so I figured the same logic should apply to coins. Who knew it wouldn't work out? And now I'm stuck with all this money, wondering how to spend it. The police tried to educate him on the illegality of using counterfeit money and the potential consequences of such actions, including imprisonment. However, looking at your foolish appearance, I'll give you a chance to make amends. Tell me, where did you buy them from? Initially, we thought buying counterfeit money online was outrageous, but it turns out this guy even met up in person within the same city. The person who sold him the counterfeit money is named Jean-Francois. This Jean-Francois registered a company called Quebec Cards three years ago in Montreal, involved in importing and exporting components related to games and toys. He also rented a small warehouse next to the post office to store his goods. The police officers handling the counterfeit money case analyzed the situation and believed that this Francois was most likely just a small-time dealer. So, they decided to take a long-term approach and trace back to his source of supply. A month later, they received news from customs that Francois had a package shipped from Guangzhou, China. The customs declaration stated that it contained metal badges, similar to the scout badges worn by the young boy in the animated movie Up. However, upon inspection by customs, there was no doubt that the package contained 500 counterfeit $2 coins, with the majority being the big-toed polar bear design. Subsequently, they searched his home in the small warehouse, discovering tens of thousands of fake coins and over a dozen counterfeit U.S. dollar bills, which, of course, were also fake. Faced with this pile of counterfeit money, Francois initially tried to argue that these were actually replicas meant for collecting, and selling them online was just a way for enthusiasts to exchange among themselves, not a counterfeit money operation. Of course, the police scoffed at this explanation. So, he then tried to defend himself by saying that these were actually a type of game currency, similar to the currency used in the board game Monopoly. He claimed that he designed them to resemble $2 coins to make the game more realistic. Seeing him being uncooperative and making baseless arguments, the police decided to bring in the snowblower buyer once again for a face-to-face -face confrontation. Finally, he opened his computer, navigated to a website, and entered keywords like Canada, commemorative coins, game coins, and $2. Within seconds, hundreds of purchasing links appeared, with prices ranging from cents to $1, some even offered at wholesale prices as low as 5 Canadian cents each. It turned out that he initially stumbled upon coins that closely resembled $2 coins and had the idea of using them to deceive others. He experimented with these coins at various grocery stores and coffee shops and found that no one suspected them. Emboldened by this success, he began using these fake coins for everyday expenses and even visited the casino periodically, using them as chips to convert into real money. As his appetite grew, he registered a shell company that claimed to import game coins and scout badges, which served as a cover for bulk purchases of counterfeit coins. He had been making over $100,000 annually, enjoying substantial profits from this counterfeit coin scheme. However, everything came to a halt with the arrival of the pandemic. Many businesses refused to accept cash, banks increased their scrutiny of deposited money, and even casinos closed down. This forced him to consider selling off the counterfeit coins to others, despite selling them at a lower price. With the lower cost of acquisition, he believed he could still make a significant profit, becoming the middleman in this lucrative venture. While Francois admitted guilt for both possessing and using counterfeit money, the police did not consider him to be the mastermind behind this extensive counterfeit coin operation. These counterfeit coins had been in circulation for over 20 years, and based on their frequency and distribution, 
it was likely that a larger counterfeit coin organization was hidden in the province of Ontario. Francois provided a valuable lead by mentioning that individuals involved in similar activities had formed a private and secretive online group known as the Counterfeit Coin Circle. Members of this circle occasionally gathered to share their experiences on how to spend counterfeit money and acquire coins that closely resembled real ones. Within this circle, there was a prominent figure who had reportedly been counterfeiting coins since the introduction of the first $2 coin in 1996. He was responsible for designing molds for coins, including those featuring the elderly queen, Queen Elizabeth I, or the popular big-toed bear, which were then optimized through repeated testing and manufactured by factories in China. This individual, the master of counterfeit coins, was rumored to reside in Toronto. In a moment of indiscretion online, he boasted about having inside connections at banks, implying that he could easily deposit even large amounts of counterfeit money as genuine currency. The police promptly inquired with Francois to discover the master counterfeiter's real name. However, Francois could only shake his head and replied, As far as I know, even the closest associates in the circle only dared to call him he. He? The police echoed in disbelief. They relayed this information to the Toronto police, emphasizing the suspicion of an insider at the banks intentionally allowing counterfeit money to pass through. Following this lead, the Toronto police indeed discovered two batches of counterfeit coins in the bank's vaults. The person responsible for depositing these coins was a 69-year-old Chinese-Canadian man named He Daixiong. Surprisingly, He Daixiong denied being the creator of the molds for these counterfeit coins. He claimed that the Chinese manufacturers faced fierce competition and possessed highly advanced technology. All they needed was a high-resolution image, along with precise dimensions and weight, to produce coins that closely resembled the originals. The apparent errors in the counterfeit coins were actually deliberate requests made by Mr. He himself. He explained that making them too similar to genuine coins would be too risky, as it could be considered counterfeiting, a serious crime. Therefore, he intentionally added distinctive features to make them look different from genuine coins. This way, even if he were caught, he could argue that these were gaming or commemorative coins, potentially reducing his legal liability. The police were left stunned by this revelation, a counterfeit coin dealer who voluntarily made coins less convincing to avoid severe legal consequences. It was almost as if he was giving Chinese manufacturers an unconventional form of advertising. As a result, the police only charged him with possession and use of counterfeit money, and Mr. He admitted guilt, receiving a $10,000 fine. Thus, the $2 counterfeit coin saga, which had stirred up the entire nation and alerted the National Security Agency, concluded with this thunderous endnote but modest outcome. In conclusion, it is crucial to remind the Canadian community that using such counterfeit coins is strictly illegal. However, after the exposure of this case, it sparked significant public interest. Some individuals even began purchasing rare and humorously inaccurate counterfeit coins for their collections, such as the Elderly Queen version, which was listed on eBay for a high price of 50 US dollars. So if you accidentally come across such coins, don't be disheartened. It might not be such a bad thing after all.